Welcome to the Next Level Human Podcast. As a human, you have a job to do. In fact, you have four jobs. To earn and manage money, to attain and maintain health and fitness, to build and sustain personal relationships, to find meaning and make a difference. None of these jobs are taught in school. And that is what this podcast is designed to do. To educate us all on living our most fulfilled lives through the mastery of these four jobs. I'm your host, Dr. Jay Tita, and I believe we are here living this life for three reasons and three reasons only. To learn, to teach, and to love. In this podcast, I will be learning, teaching, and loving right along with you. I'm grateful to have your company. Here's to our next level. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to today's show. Today, I've got Dr. Tina Moore with me, a very good friend of mine. I've gotten very close to her over the last little bit, and I'm going to be doing more with her in the near future. This particular conversation is a really great one, in my opinion. I had a great time hanging with Tina. She's always so insightful. Her and I are the same age, and we basically had a discussion around how we're staying fit, how we deal with uh, you know, sort of the tough social interactions that come along with being being a human and lots of different things around that dynamic. You know, it's funny. I oftentimes talk about the idea that fitness is a metaphor for life. And so we cover some of the ways that we're doing this and working through both our fitness challenges and our personal relationship challenges. And I loved this conversation. For those of you who do not know about Dr. Tina Moore, please check her out on Instagram. Um, She is just a wealth of knowledge and specializes really in pain management. She is both a chiropractor and a naturopathic physician, and just a badass human. And uh, I'm super excited for you to get exposed to her here. So enjoy the show, and I will talk to you all soon. First thing, first thing I want everyone to know, so welcome on the show, Miss Dr. Tina. Thank <laughs> <Ms. you. laughs> um, So first, get us started, uh, you know, to get to know you. If, if someone was going to sort of jump in, you have a kind of eclectic background in a sense and, and do a <laughs> lot of great things. Um, but just drop us into your world for a second and give us a sense of who you are and why you do what you do and, you know, what you love and wherever you want to start. I just want to hear the story. All right. Uh, <laughs> where should I start? So I am a naturopathic doctor and a chiropractor, and I know you through that community somewhat. I know you also through the entrepreneurial online community to some degree. Um, I live in Portland, Oregon, so I'm very, I I joke, you know, I was raised in the Midwest a bit, and then I grew up in California and Portland, so I'm very much like West Coast, Best Coast girl. I used to be a punk rock girl, so I love all things, uh, I love rebellion. (laughs) (laughs) I do, I love bucking the system, and I love rebellion. Hence the the naturopathic uh, (laughs) doctorate. (laughs) <laughs> right. That's exactly it. I was like, what's the most punk rock thing I could do in medicine? I always wanted to be a doctor. I was a very sick little child. And I knew I always wanted to be a doctor. I got into chiropractics just because I'd always been a patient of chiropractors, but then ended up meeting a really amazing, um, you know, just, he, he was just a, he, he was just a mover and a shaker. Dr. Rick Marinelli became my mentor. He's now deceased, but he was a huge force in our profession, at least on my side of things. And got to work with him for decades. So that was really awesome. And he was just a, you know, buck the system kind of guy. So I really, you know, I've taken that, I've transitioned out of practice and I've just taken all of that at it. I think about it all the time. I went and saw a documentary on Depeche Mode last night and I was thinking about all the music in my life that has been the soundtrack to my life. And I wouldn't be saying the things or being the truth teller I am today if it hadn't been for those albums, you know, some of those key, yeah. key albums in my life of like rebellion and just waking up and um, I joke that I kind of woke up when I was 14, you know, I kind of like realized what was going on in the world and I got really pissed off. And so went headlong into medicine, hope, hoping to change things in a big way, realizing easier said than done. But, you know, through social media, through like partnering up with people like you and getting, getting the message out, I think there's a lot we can do for people. So yeah. I love dogs. I love strength training. I love coffee. 
I love that you figured out your life at 14 and it took you to 40. <laughs> no, I just got really mad at 14. I watched my homeroom teacher go clinically insane at 14. And it was the same year that the Berlin Wall came down. So I just, you know, the same year that like Nine Inch Nails, Pretty Hate Machine came out. So all of it was like, ah, in my head. And I just remember kind of like turning my lights on, realizing the adults did not have it figured out yeah. either. <laughs> yeah. You know, so... It, this, this this really kind of pushes you and I into something that, you know, I think we both want to discuss. And this is this idea of, so here's this chiropractor, this naturopath, this sort of punk rock girl, also <laughs> very much into, um, you know, sort of bucking the system and being sort of a renegade or going rogue or however you want to put it. And one of the things that happens, and also you and I are very much um, out front uh, for, and you even more so than me for the profession, the naturopathic profession online and social media. And one of the things I think that I always wonder about with people like you, and e even with me, because people ask me about it, is how do you develop the mindset and the thick skin to do those things? Because if, if we're following, if, if you're listening and you're hearing Tina's story a little bit, you, you get this sort of idea of someone who has um, the courage to be disliked, the courage to sort of do things that are, is, that are unpopular, and the courage to be out front and take a lot of the hits. And um, I know I oftentimes talk about resistance training and strength training being a metaphor for life and having given me a lot of that sort of um, confidence and competence to kind of do other things in other domains. And I think that from watching you, you're similar on that. And so I wanted to kind of, um, especially now we're, we're in our forties, right? Like, so I'm 45 and you're, I think you're not quite 40 yet, right? Or I'm 45. Okay, that's right. We're the exact same age. Yeah. <laughs> same and so, yeah, yeah. And so we we talk about you know strength training and things like that a little bit differently than maybe other individuals, right? And so I want to kind of drop in there first and just see where this conversation goes because I think what ends up happening, and I'll kind of frame this for all the listeners. One of the things that happens, and from talking to Tina, I think she will give us some interesting insights on this, is that when we're young. We, you know, resistance training, working out, all that kind of stuff is, is very much vanity driven, um, I think, for a lot of us. And then it starts to turn into something else. We never learn that vanity. We never uh, sort of lose that vanity effect. I don't know that it's necessarily a bad thing, just that if we're all vanity all the time, that's not going to keep us doing this into our 40s and 50s and 60s and beyond. And so I kind of want to just get your, your take on that and where you're at with your, you know, um, your practice in, in strength training, what it does for you. And let's just kind of dive into that to give people sort of a sense of, even if, if you're younger and listening to this, a sense of what it's like to, you know, try to stay in shape and continue this practice. And also for people, you know, our age who are, you know, in the struggle with us or just beginning. Yeah, that's a great question. I always say that I'm training for life because... I was a really sick kid. I went, I was a strong little kid. I was a gymnast. And so I had a lot of strength, like crazy little girl strength. And then I became, you know, I went like the punk rock chain smoking route and I just drank Snapple and became a mac and cheese -itarian and, you know, smoked a pack a day, drank too much, just took really, really, really shitty care of myself through my twenties and into my thirties. Um, and then I, I realized through just trial and error that strength training was really it for me because it didn't completely disintegrate my adrenal glands the way other types of exercise did. And it gave me muscle. And I started researching the benefits of muscle, the actual physiologic benefits of muscle itself, which was like a whole other awesome thing. And started geeking out on the research. But more than anything, I started realizing that like, I love bucking the system. I I love it. Like even as a kid, I loved I loved raising my hand and being insubordinate in class for a good reason. Like I loved challenging my teachers. I loved asking the hard questions. I loved and not just to be a little brat, but like when I could tell they were obviously skating around something or whatever. In in a uh, high school, I had the privilege of having some really really renegade teachers. Like all three of them ended up getting fired eventually after I graduated, but like those three men taught me how to think. They taught me how to fight for what was right. One of them was an East German who taught me about propaganda and how to identify it and how to, you know, just amazing. He was my history teacher. It was amazing. So I, from a young age, I think I really enjoyed that. But then as I 
got sicker and sicker through my 20s, I started to lose that and strength training brought it back. Like it brought back the inner Tina, you know, and it's, to me, it's like, do hard things, do hard things regularly, do hard things in a place that's safe, that you can control the variables. And that way it'll translate into hard things in the rest of your life. So like right now I'm training for my SFG1 kettlebell certification. It's hard. I just did a snatch test. I had to do a hundred snatches in five minutes with a kettlebell. And uh, by set three, I was like, I felt all of my, I felt my central nervous system freak out. <laughs> and I was like, this is a total mind game. This has nothing to do with physicality at this point. Like I'm either going to freak out and lose my shit and throw up or pass out, which is what I felt like doing, or I'm going to get through this. And I got through it and I made it right on the dime, like right at the, as the bell rang, I hit my hundredth snatch. And I was like, all right. You know, and then my coach wanted to go through some of the things I need to work on. But for me, all I kept thinking was, all right, I've done it. Now I'm not afraid of it anymore. Like I did it. I've been like so afraid of this or so anticipatory of this thing. I did it. I like getting on stage and talking. I like getting on podcasts and talking and speaking my truth because I don't care if people don't like me. Like that's the best part about turning 40 is you just don't give any fucks if people like you. <laughs> it really is true. You really start, you really do start not caring. But, yeah. but actually I want to, I want, I don't want to let that pass by because so tell, just so people know, so tell them about the strong first certification and also how badass this is, because this is not like, this is one of the harder things that you could do. And for a 45 year old male or female to take that certification <laughs> on, is uh just insane so tell tell the listeners a little bit about that if they don't know and why you chose it because it's pretty it's again it, it illustrates it's your hardcore. your sort of <laughs> oh my god yes it really does well it's um it's a russian hard style kettlebell system that came out of like from what i understand the kgb so and the guy who runs the show pavel is hardcore and it's it's hard you have to do it's all about control and precision and then so there's grind moves which would be like a press or some of the other moves where you have to grind through it and then there's these moves where you really have to show a a complete amount of total body control and then a lot of it's just mental so that snatch test you've got to you know they look easy people make them look easy but they're hard and you've got to do a hundred of them in five minutes which means 10 snatches per side every 30 seconds for five minutes and it really challenges your stamina physically, but I think mentally, that's, that's what I'm starting to realize. This is just a mental game. So um, I don't know. I decided to go after it because I really love the strength and conditioning community. And I don't have, I mean, I'm a chiropractor and I have a lot of rehab experience, but I don't have any of the like official strength and conditioning or personal training certifications. And I was like, I want something because I really want to interact with this community more on their level and understand, you know, I go to conferences with them and stuff, but, or to workshops, but uh, I was like, what's the hardest thing I could get? <laughs> I want the hardest one. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and I went at, it's been years. I've been going after this for years, which is also another lesson. Like this is the long game, right? Business, life, all these things are the long game. And I couldn't even do most of these moves with just my body, let alone like the other day I was doing 24 kilo swings, like a hundred of them, like it was nothing. And I just thought every time I do that, I just think, God, how far I've come. You know, I'm so proud of myself for sticking with it, eating right, sleeping right, doing all the things to earn this. And it doesn't just come by osmosis. Like you really have to work for it. And I think that translates into everything that I do. So. Just, just for you all listening, if you want to know what that, that kettlebell, um, I've actually, I've, I've done that, not the actual certification, but I've, I've done those, um, those kettlebell snatches and, you know, in many, many workouts. If you want to know what that's like, you know, for five minutes, that's really like doing an all out sprint, stopping for like a couple seconds and then doing <laughs> another all out sprint. And, and it's almost worse than that because it's like a sprint, like, sprinting with the whole body but you're also throwing weight up over your head so it's like your whole body is just heaving it's almost like um this heaving electrical ball of just like super intensity and you have to go stop go stop and by the time you get through three of these you are so exhausted you're and you really do feel like you're gonna vomit or throw up it's a really difficult thing to go through now obviously if you're not getting, you know, the certification, you can stop and rest longer and probably should, which we'll get into. Right. But when you're going into this sort of um, this kind of intensity does teach you something um, about your body. It's kind of like in, in my mind, it's kind of like saying, all right, well, I'm going to put my hand on this hot stove and I'm not going to take it off. 
Um, I'm going to let it burn pretty bad. I'm going to give myself a break and then I'm going to stick my hand back on that hot stove <laughs> and let it burn again. And you're right on the edge of safety the entire time. So it's just, it's a, it's a hugely um, a sort of impactful thing. And then one of the things that happens when you finish something like this is you come out of it and you go, if I can get through that, then I can get through the next two days of hard work, or I can deal with this difficult conversation, or I can, you know, handle my financial yeah. stuff, or I can do other things. And so the Next Level Human podcast, part of the reason I want people like Tina on this show is because this, this is sort of what it's about. It translates into other uh, sort of areas of life. And so what I want to kind of transition into is that you mentioned a couple things, like the idea of like, you know, my central nervous system is fried. The idea of like, this is going to have an impact on my adrenals. The idea of sort of remaking yourself and you, you know, you, you kind of uh, didn't take great care of yourself in your twenties and thirties. And all of a sudden you start from scratch and sort of build up to this place where your financial job is taken care of. Your physical health is getting better and stronger at 45. Your sort of um, purpose and meaning has taken on, you know, this, uh, powerful mission of, of, you know, sort of getting the word out and this whole mindset. I want to sort of understand how someone gets started with this and how strength training sort of integrates and where would they start if they want to start sort of getting this effect where they use strength training to level up in other areas. Cause that sounds like essentially what you've done. You leveled up, you leveled up. And then you were like, I want to use strength training to even level up further. I think they need to hire a coach first off. And not just any coach, they need to, I really like the strong first system. That's the kettlebell system I'm talking about. I really like the functional movement uh, screening system. I, I just think people who have done those certs actually give a shit more than just like, oh, I did a weekend, you know, personal training thing. Um, not to say that those aren't great coaches out there for that too, but find a good coach, pay them and understand this is not a like, oh, I'll go three times until I learn the moves and then I'll do it by myself. Like, I pay my coach a good amount of money to train me because she programs it based around where I'm at. Like, am I exhausted? Like when I came off my summit event that I had a few weeks ago, I was exhausted. So she dialed down my workout for that day. And I know you talk about this. You have like green days and yellow days and, you know, you have days where you like go full out and other days where you dial it back. And I think that's more important as we get older to really understand that. Um, I think that it's, just critical to invest in that process and commit to it and real like there are not there's nothing there's nothing that will get me to cancel my training sessions with her like I will cancel patients I will cancel family events I will cancel things before I'll cancel training with her because that's where I go like reset and so it took me a long time to find somebody like her it wasn't just overnight I went through several coaches so you know continuing on that quest just like you find a good doctor you know you continue to look until you find that person that you work well with that really understands you and just understand that this is the long game. We don't, we're not chasing numbers here. That's how you get hurt. I'm not trying to get hurt. I want to be 80 years old and still doing this, you know? Yeah. There's vanity involved for sure. But like, I want to be 80 and still be able to snatch a kettlebell without yeah. my arm breaking off. I don't, I want to be able to climb the great wall of China. If I feel like it at 80, I want to have good, a good sex life and good mobility and good, enjoy, you know, I want all of those things. And I, I feel like when you lose your capacity to be a physical human being, you just lose so much. And I've lost it before. And I just, you just lose everything. You don't just lose your confidence. You lose everything. You lose your libido, you lose your sleep, you lose your joy, you lose, um, you lose the ability to see your friends doing something. And you're like, I can't do that. Like I'm not physically fit enough to do that. And that's a huge epidemic in our age group right now. Yeah. You know, we look amazing for our age. I will say that. <laughs> like we should applaud ourselves because most of my friends are starting to, as yours, yours as well. I mean, our, my 30 year reunion's coming up and I'm like, oh Lordy. Yeah. Like, let's see if how everyone's, you know, when people get snarky with me, like women in their twenties and thirties, and I'm like, you just hang on girlfriend. Let's see how you're doing when you're in your forties. You keep talking because... Yeah. <laughs> We'll see how this translates in 20 years, you know? I often say that. I remember looking back, and I just did a post on this on Instagram. I remember looking back at some of the super fit people in the gym at 40 and 50 when I was in my 20s. And I was impressed with them, but not nearly as impressed as I am with them now. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and, and to your point, with myself, with, with sort of the ups and downs. And I build in for myself lots of ways to keep myself um, accountable, right? You know, 
literally lots of ways to keep myself accountable. Like, like silly things actually where, you know, training with my shirt off at the CrossFit gym that I go at with all these young people that look great where I look, you know, kind of <laughs> not so great. You look and great. <laughs> you look great. Yeah, I'm thank sure. you. And, and it keeps and it keeps me um it, it's little sort of tricks like that. And people might think it's about vanity, mm-hmm. right? And vanity is, I think, um part of it simply because it keeps you honest. Like I've oftentimes thought to myself, I'm like, well, if we had no vanity, vanity does have some utility. It's just that as you get older at 45, like vanity starts to go out the window. Now you're just trying to play tricks to kind of keep <laughs> yourself going. But what I want to get from you, because I think you come at this from a very interesting place, the, the chiropractic background and the naturopathic background. This is what I want to dive into with you. Because on the one hand, when people are listening to you and I talk, and this is really about, hey, two people, 45 years old, who've stayed relatively fit and have parlayed that fitness, that health and fitness into uh, career fitness and relationship fitness and sort of all the different jobs of being a next level human. When you kind of look at that, you kind of say, well, how, how do I keep from getting hurt if I start doing this? That's where the chiropractic part comes in. And how do I keep from burning out, you know, my nervous system and being so fatigued? And, you know, we see this happen a lot and it starts happening more at yours and my age where people get into exercise. They try to do it all at once. They, their physical body gets injured as a result and or they just overdo it. And their metabolism is driving them crazy with cravings and hunger and all that. So I want to kind of get into with you, what would you say and what is the approach that that you use with sort of keeping our bodies physically fit and sort of our metabolisms um, not overstretched or overstressed when we start to engage with this fitness lifestyle? A couple things. I think it mainly comes down to nutrition is huge, huge, huge. Uh, I came home the other night from that snatch test. I did not know I was going to be going into a snatch test. I did not have food prepared when I got home and I don't eat out of the house very much anymore because it just gets me into trouble. Like I've decided if I want to have the level of health and vitality that I strive for that I need, I had to learn to cook. So I learned to cook this year. I only know how to cook in an instant pot, (laughs) but I'm cooking. (laughs) I'm cooking all my meals. I might cook half of it in the instant pot and roast the rest, but like I am learning how to cook. And I'm so proud of myself because for 45 years, I was like, I'm not cooking. Um, but I'm learning to cook. Nutrition is key. I came home from that snatch test and my central nervous system got hit so hard that I, I literally went into a total funk that night. Like I was so tired. I couldn't take a shower. I had no food to eat and I was super depressed. And so I was like, you know what, I'm going to have a protein shake and go to bed and revisit this tomorrow and like not do that again. Cause that was a bad idea. Like I was so depressed, but I knew I was depressed because I just got whomped. Like my CNS had just gotten whomped. And if I didn't know what I know as a doctor, I would have confused that with real depression, but it was just a false emotion. You know, I was like, I just need to go to bed. I slept for like 12 hours. I got up, got, went to the grocery store, got some food, cooked it all, started eating yesterday. By the time I was halfway through yesterday, I ate a bunch yesterday. I felt great. Um, Got another good night's sleep, but like, I got to maintain this stuff. And it's not just about like fancy biohacking you know, collagen in your coffee and all that stuff, that's helpful. But it's, it's like just living a good, clean, healthy life. Like I also made sure I got up early and got outside and got some sunlight today. And then I came back in and I rested. Like I just laid down and rested until I had to get, get up and get ready to talk to you. Honestly, I was like, I'm just going to rest this morning. Cause I have a few hours that I can rest. So like, it's all this little stuff. I don't even call it self-care. It's just like sanity. You know, it's like, Eat, so it's hormesis. You have to stress the organism hard and then you have to rest it and feed it. And I think as a society, we don't feed it and rest it very well. We just hit it, hit it, hit it. Yeah. And so I don't know. I think it's, and then really truthfully, as I get older, cutting toxic people out of my life, just cutting any bullshit. Anyone who brings my cortisol up more than three times just has to go. I just send them away with love and light, but <laughs> it's got to go. I can't. I can't be having people who don't know how to manage their monkeys around me. So all of those things translate into me training well, which. Uh, Yeah. So let me, let me, let me uh, just kind of feedback what I think I hear you saying. And then I have a kind of follow up question. So it sounds like, okay, you, you go into this crazy sort of uh, training session. You're not really, you're not really planning on it completely. And you know, when I think when Tina says fries her nervous system, I know what that feels like. I think some of us do to me, it, it, it feels like, I finished that workout and I feel off. Like I can feel off for up to 48 hours after that. 
sometimes my sleep's disrupted. Sometimes I sleep fine, but, but don't feel recovered. I can't move the next day. I get really fatigued, I think, for me. But then, you know, you essentially say, all right, I, I know what I did. Now I'm going to make sure I train the correct way and take plenty of rest. So my follow-up question to that is how often do, are you to, to maintain this, right? Because you do this very hard workout and then you kind of have this regime of I'm resting and I'm feeding to recover. How often would you say for you at this age that you would do a workout like that? Because I imagine most of your workouts are not at that intensity. No. <laughs> they're, kind of, they're kind of below. So walk us through how you manage that. Because I have my way. I'm curious how you have your way of being like, I do, you know, one hard workout a month or a week or whatever it is. And then the rest is sort of what? Yeah. So she, my coach Mira, um, coach, she programs me. But what I've noticed what she does is I'll probably have one of these a month where she really fries me out. And all she did was have me do a couple loaded moves with a heavier bell to get me going. And then she took me right into the snatch test. I think I was in there all in all a good 35 minutes. And then I was done. Like I left early my hour. I still, I had an hour training session, but I was like, I'm done. She had me walk five laps until I could catch my breath. And then she's like, all right, you can, should we did a, lo- a couple little things just to calm it down. And then she sent me home She'll have me train uh, one other day a month or maybe two other days a month where I go very heavy, but it's very like light reps. Mm -hmm. And then she'll throw in a day like the other day when I did 24 kilo swings for a hundred, every minute on the minute I did 10, you know, until I got to a hundred. And then she'll have some like metabolic stuff in there where it's much lighter weight, but I'm, she's just getting me, she's got me in a circuit. So it's like, I'm doing swings. I'm doing, I'm doing snatches. I'm doing presses I'm doing whatever there'll be some push-ups or some renegade rows and it's all lightweight and it's just to get me sweaty and so I feel like I'm really only getting hit hard maybe like twice a month at most at very most and I used to train beyond that myself this is why I have a coach because I'm type a and I want all the things instantly (laughs) so I'll train super hard on my own accord and I'll blow myself out or I'll hurt myself that's how you avoid injury you have you do not keep chasing numbers it's hard because I, I would just trash my shoulders or my hips or whatever. And then I didn't know how to train around it. So I just keep going into it. And that's not good. Yeah, I do this. It's funny. I do the same, very similar thing. Now. I mean, I program all my own stuff because I did it for so long. But for me, it's like maybe one, I'm lucky if I get one super hard workout in a week. Right now, it probably happens once every two weeks. And most of the time, and, and by the way, this is just help people. I, I tend to do CrossFit style stuff, which is so I have a coach, um, but I tend to, you know, sort of take whatever the workout is and then do what Tina does, which is what Tina's coach does, is that I will either, if I'm not feeling recovered, I'll either go much lighter and not RX the workout or I'll RX the workout and go much slower um, so that I'm not really trying to uh, compete against anybody in the gym. I'm looking at, you know, two, you know, two weeks later, trying to get one super heavy workout in, you know, where I can kind of push my body. But it isn't that interesting that, you know, sort of we're both, you know, sort of of that mindset. And then for me, I'm always looking at how did I recover before I do that again? Like, I I tend to feel like sometimes I'm like, I'm not ready for a really hard workout again. And by the way, when I come into a workout, like I, you and I were talking, you know, the other week when you were here in LA, and I, I had not trained probably four times in the last six weeks, which is rare that I go that long without training. And now as I come back into this workout, especially now, I'm very lighter weights and slower. So now, you know, now it's both. I'm going much lighter and slower until I can condition myself to be conditioned. And I oftentimes think people miss that. It's like, it's like we do have to treat ourselves with athletes a little bit to sort of prepare for this. So I don't know, I don't know how you feel about that, especially with sort of the chiropractic, you know, sort of realm. I oftentimes am hurting myself. So any tips with that? (laughs) Just just starting out. So my specialty the last decade has been in regenerative injection therapy. So like I'm OG prolo girl, like before stem cells got sexy, I was doing regenerative joint injections. And the whole concept of that is that your ligaments and tendons have a poor blood supply and that where they insert on bone is called the enthesis. And that's a continuum of cells. It's not just a frank delineation of like, here's your tendon, here's your bone. They flow into each other and become bone. 
that area is highly innervated. That's where a lot of micro tears happen and a lot of little tiny injuries happen. That's where most people's pain comes from. It's not necessarily coming from inside the joint. Everybody wants to get hung up on the cartilage defect or the labral tear or whatever's happening inside the joint. But before that ever happens, the joint starts to lose its tensegrity. It starts to lose its ability to, to hold itself together in a stable way and uh, move efficiently. And that's because these ligaments and tendons start to become compromised. And so prolotherapy is not just what's in your syringe, but it's a series of injections around the joint where you're stabilizing down all of these little structures and all these little tiny tears. And I'll tell you, I'm so good with my palpation that people will come in and here's their MRI and it says all these horrible things and they're sure it's this thing and they're about to get surgery. And I find some little tiny swath of tendon or ligament insertion that's so highly painful and it recreates all their pain. And if I can palpate it, I can stick a needle in it and make it feel better. What's in my syringe varies from anywhere from like sugar water all the way up to stem cells. So it doesn't really matter. It's just the technique is what counts. Most doctors today doing these procedures don't know this technique. So they're just shooting juice in a joint. They're literally going under ultrasound, delivering whatever expensive solution they have into your joint and calling it good. But the shoulder, for instance, as you well know, there's a lot going on there. (laughs) There's probably 40 spots I would want to inject on a shoulder to make it feel better, not just shoot it intra-articularly into the joint. So um, for me, like prolotherapy is number one. I I think finding a good prolotherapist, that's just sugar water. It's very affordable and inexpensive. And I inject myself. I inject my assistant. My assistant injects me. Like I would not be this active without having regular, at least once a year, having a few of my joints tuned up a little bit. If anything starts to nag at me longer than six weeks, I just shoot it up with a little sugar water. Like my thumb recently was giving me beef um, and it just goes away. But that said, strength training is kind of like prolotherapy. What, pro, what we're doing with the injections is not only are we causing bleeding there, micro needling it, but we're injecting a solution that causes a modulated inflammatory response that's controlled, which is awesome. So we're kind of we're kind of giving it a second chance at healing. Strength training does the same thing, really. If you think about it, we're doing these you know, concentric and eccentric moves. It's pulling the muscle or the tendon or the ligament a little bit away from the bone, which is causing a little bit of damage and a little bit of micro bleeding, which is what heals it up. So consistency, I think, is more critical than anything. Um, not that you shouldn't take time off, because I'll take like two weeks off at a time just to let my body reset. But I think, and I come back stronger. But, and I feed myself and rest myself really well during that period. But just having um, a consistent strength training regimen in your life will basically give those ligaments and tendons a chance to sort of pull and heal and pull and heal. And so it builds a much stronger joint. My patients who have been strength training for decades, like these old guys in their 70s or 80s, their joints are so stable. I mean, they might have wear and tear and pain here and there, but man, it's not just old man strength that we can talk about. It's literally like the attachment of that muscle onto the joint is so spot welded in comparison to somebody who, my analogy is a crock pot. Most of America is sitting around obese and we know that fat cells secrete a lot of inflammatory markers and cytokines. And they're basically sitting around in a suit of inflammation and toxicity, which is their adipose tissue. And what happens when you take a grisly piece of meat and you cook it on slow and low, for hours in a crock pot, it melts off the bone. So that's what's happening to most of America, in my opinion. They're sort of melting off their own bones because they're not, that's why strength training in particular is critical because it's like mini prolo. Does that make sense? Oh my, that's, <laughs> I, I, love, I love the way you describe that. So there's so much gold in that whole sort of description. It's just beautiful. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. If you're listening to this, it's, for those who don't know pro, what prolotherapy is, it's really interesting, right? Because for those of us who are 45, some of you might have these joint pains and stuff like this where you're like, well, I couldn't possibly do what you and Tina are doing. This can sort of get you back to where you can begin to handle some things. And then I love the way Tina's essentially saying, and by the way, resistance training has to be a consistent sort of uh, thing here. And it's also doing somewhat the same thing. And it's highly anti-inflammatory. Yeah. And you know, it's funny for me, what I tend to do, um, and I'll ask you this because I don't know, you're, this is more your area of expertise. One of the things that I have done for myself, when I really start feeling my joints act up, I do a lot of CrossFit stuff, which is very ballistic and a, you know, a lot of slinging weight around the, the way I describe it. And once I start feeling my joints begin to act up, 
I go back into old school bodybuilding stuff. I go slow. I really focus on the eccentric movements mm -hmm. and lots of different uh, angles. Like, for example, I don't do I do a lot of overhead presses and straight presses and CrossFit. Mm -hmm. I don't do a lot of where I'm leaning forward and dips and things like that, where I get to kind of have my arm sort of back or more of the row type of stuff. So I start going really slow eccentrics. And that's the, the lowering portion of the movement and lots of different angles and my joints feel great. So sometimes yep. when I take off from CrossFit, I go two weeks. So what's happening there? Is this similar to what you were sort of describing? That's exactly it. Because, you know, we know in the uh, rehab community that eccentric moves are the best for tendon strength. And this is why, because you're causing these little micro traumas, which is essentially like tightening you up and healing you up. Whereas those ballistic movements are tearing you up. Yeah. So, I mean, not always, it depends on how frequently you're doing it, how fast you're doing it, how much weight, but. And how much you're recovering. I, I love the way you're, you're kind of uh, saying that. And then for someone like me who has shoulder issues, going in to get these prolotherapy, you know, sort of injections can sort of shore those areas up and allow me to handle a little bit more. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. It's when we go too far into a joint injury or we have too big of a tear that we really create problems. But my patients, just interestingly, uh, I've looked at all the, I've been doing this a long time. My mentor, I mean, I've been in prolotherapy since I'm 45. I've been in this world since I was 22. So I've been watching people get prolotherapy for like, I am old school pro. When people start going on about regen med, I'm like, dude, I've been watching this go down for a long time. I've seen thousands of patients get treated. If I've not myself treated thousands, um, tens of thousands of joints, because I normally treat two or three joints on each patient. But of all the variables, hormone status, uh, nutrition, their diet, their sleep, all the things that we have some control over, their gut health, all of those things, the one variable I found to be the most consistent in whether or not they were going to respond well to these therapies was their muscle mass. Mm, interesting. If, they, if they have good muscle mass, they just heal right up. They could be Mountain Dew drinking, you know, 7-Eleven eating bodybuilders, which most aren't. But, you know, sometimes they eat a lot of crap because yeah. it's in all the shakes and all that. Like, ugh. But um, if they have good muscle mass, they just heal up lickety split. I mean, I could like wave a wand at them and they, <laughs> they heal up. It's a few simple injections. Now, the women in particular, it's women who have never exercised a day in their life or they've done a ton of yoga and overstretched and done a ton of running. So they've never really built muscle. I'm not saying yoga or running is bad, but I think you kind of have to earn it. And it's, you know, you, you counter it with strength training. Um, those women just have so many, so many tears. Like they, I'll put the ultrasound down and there's no muscle holding their arm up on their shoulder. Like this is a huge, heavy appendage. It needs to be latched on with muscles. And so ligaments are stabilizers, muscles are movers. And when people have compromised their ligamentous system through poor diet, my, for me, I was anorexic for decades. So like poor nutrition, smoking, all the things I mentioned, being vegetarian. Um, if they do that, and then all of a sudden they have some kind of ballistic trauma, like everything just rips apart, right? And it's really difficult for me or anyone else to put them back together versus like you, I could probably fix your shoulders up like nothing. Like it'd be so simple, right? So I'm on a plane to Portland. Yeah, just come. So you know. <laughs> I'm my, ready. My pra just for the audience, my practice is closed, but I do treat my. I, I only treat the people I want to hug. So yeah. <laughs> that's my I rule. Agree. Yeah, I appreciate it. That's a good rule, actually. Yeah. And you know what I? You know what I love? You're describing here. I, I love the visual. I always love visuals. You notice about me. I love the visual of this steak, uh, you know, being cooked and sort of coming off the bone. And I also love this visual of being in this soup of inflammation when you have fat on your body and then to me also muscle one of the things we know about muscle is that fat which is you know just sort of inert and sits there and it's sort of secreting this you know this inflammatory acid let's say muscle is actually the opposite of yep. that it is literally when you move it it actually puts out the you know the the flame retardant it literally does and so moving the body is hugely important. And so part of one of the things I do as well, and I think you do too, is that a lot of walking for me is one of the things that I do to make sure that I'm keeping that anti-inflammatory sort of process going. And it's very relaxing in terms of lowering stress hormones. And so I think Tina and I both, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tina, but I think we both use that sort of, um, sort of push Let's, that's sort of a stress that helps our body get better, that hormesis that you're sort of talking about. We also have a lot of this relaxation sort of movement built in 
as well that kind of keeps the, the inflammation down. And of course, you know, getting the right diet and keeping adipose tissue off the body, which gets harder and harder, it certainly has gotten harder and harder for me. It, it is hard. It's, I mean, the struggle is real. My testosterone tanked out last or a couple of years ago. I could not figure out what it was. And like, I mean, I went from lean and strong to just like, oh, I mean, I just turned into a middle-aged woman like that. I did not, I did not know what was happening. And it literally was as simple as like cutting gluten out, getting the inflammation down. That was step one, healing my gut up, which is like naturopathy 101. But then getting a little testosterone on board was huge. Um, and then these walks, you're right. Like, since I got to be honest, you inspired me to start walking. I spent the whole summer just trying to heal up my spirit and heal up my body and heal up a lot of things. And I just went for these long walks and it was a lot of, it was cued on by, you know, content you'd created in my bread and, uh, just seeing, you know, Jill Coleman, she walks a lot. Yeah. She's my friend. And I haven't been walking as much because of the rain has come yeah. to Portland. And I, yesterday I was out there and I was like, man, I just got to bundle up better and do it. Like just suck it up and have the right gear because being outside is key. Just getting the light in your eyes alone is huge, you know, but I got to, yeah, the walks are, and I just call them lollygagging walks. Like I just, yeah. la la la. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Same. It's, it's funny when I lecture in the UK, I always say you need to go for leisurely walks, and they're like, "You mean leisurely?" <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> leisurely, leisurely. But you know, it's funny when I was in Seattle, it was really tough for me too because the the winters there they're not they're not necessarily super cold actually, which surprised me. Even though you're further north, they're just super dreary and wet. And yeah. so, but one of the things I used to love about that is all the all like the negative ions or whatever it is outside when you kind of take that deep breath and you just feel so good. So I would I would do the same thing you do. I'd bundle up. I'd put like, you know, all, my rain suit on and I'd be out there walking oftentimes. And it's, it's, it's really just a beautiful feeling. There's something about being out in that sort of brisk cold. I mean, obviously, if, if you're listening to this and you live in Minnesota or something like that, it's like, <laughs> you're gonna have to do this on a treadmill in your house, but it yeah. still works um, surprisingly well. So, that is so true about the negative ions. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, you, it's it's like it's so green up in that part of, of oh, the yeah. country. It's just insane. It's something about the air that's different than down than down here, sort of where I am. But yeah. let me let let's transition into because one of the things you and I also share, despite our you know, despite just our love of resistance training, is this idea of you know, like you mentioned it. You're just like, look, you know, as I get older and I'm trying to you know balance this sort of work and recovery and stay healthy. Like I'm also really working on my personal relationships and, you know, like you're like, I only treat people that I want to hug. And I also cut out, you know, quote, toxic people from my lives. And I, you know, I want to hear a little bit about that because I think oftentimes these discussions, especially with people like you and I who are steeped in the health and fitness world, we oftentimes um, forget that, you know, part of this recovery process and part of being able to focus and do resistance training and do the things that we need to do to build our body up also have a lot to do with what's going on in our mental state. And you and I have some yeah. interesting, both of us have some interesting stories in our lives about dealing with romantic relationships and dealing with, you know, tough sort of uh, personal relationships and overcoming a lot of that. And so I'm just, I just want to ask you about like, what's like, what's your real strategy about that? And how much of a difference do you think it makes when you're, you know, you're in recovery mode and just having a, a healthy life? Well, I forgave myself for one, for being, I'm very empathic. So I pick up a lot. And when you're tired and when you're worn out, which I think I spent decades being like just worn out to the bone, um, you can't really, you can't really protect your aura very well. Like you can't protect your energetic space very well when you're that tired or you're that worn out. Like one of the things I do with my, the doctors I coach in business is I try to get them to free up one day a week just to have space just to have silence just to have like stillness and in the stillness you find the answers right and so creating a lot of stillness and space around me was huge and then I realized okay I have got to get control of my monkeys like my mon we all have monkeys right and I know some of them are sassy and some of them like to fling poo and some of them have foul mouths <laughs> and I was like oh that's cool like they serve a purpose but we need to manage them and it became very clear to me that a lot of people are not managing their monkeys and 
I, some of these people I love, I mean, I love them dearly and I wish them the absolute best in life, but I'm just like, dude, I can't be ha- like, I am trying so hard to reset my cortisol. I could say I'm in cortisol anonymous. Cause I'm trying to really <laughs> like, I was so addicted to stress. I was, so, I was that girl. I was like my brain, my receptors in my brain needed an astronomical amount of stress and cortisone to cortisol to keep feeling normal really. And that comes out of childhood, just like a lot of stress in my childhood. And when I finally realized that and I got still, I was like, I can't be having people up around me who also are that way. I think I will get more Jedi powers as I get older and I'll be able to manage those, those boundaries better and still keep them in my life maybe, but at a distance. But for right now, I'm just like, dude, this is my inner circle. I'm 45. I've done everything I was supposed to do over the years for everybody else. I raised a child. I became a doctor. I had a successful practice. I take care of my parents. Like I do all the things. And I was like, I just want my inner circle to be full of people I love who are also leveled up. Like they've done the work. And sometimes it's youth. The youthful people haven't even had the experience to have to overcome some of these hardships. So they just sort of like spin out in chaos. And I'm not saying all young people, but I really want people who in my life and around me, it, whether it's on social media or whether it's on, in real life interactions or whether it's romantically, people who've also done the work. And I think I get to be picky. I think that's okay. And I don't have any, I don't, I don't, I used to feel, I used to be hard on myself about that. But now I'm like, you know, I'm going to forgive myself for having these boundaries because that's what they are. And that's it. <laughs> so. Yeah, I love that. You know, it's for me, it's a, a very similar thing. And and it and it's funny, part of the reason I wanted to draw this analogy just for everyone listening is that think about like, you know, uh, talking to Tina and she's talking about this uh, exposing herself to strength training and the growth that produces. And you don't do that. You do that to grow. Like you expose yourself to that hard stuff so that your joints get stronger, so that your muscles get stronger. And it's sort of the same thing here as well, right? And then you get savvy with the training and you learn to do it better and recover better and train harder. I think it's the same with, um, with people and dealing with people in our lives. It's sort of like people are practice. They are growth. They can help you sort of level up. And we forget to look for those lessons when we're betrayed or when we um, are treated poorly or when we have people who are Um, you know, quote, toxic in our lives. In a sense, it's very much to me like resistance training. It's an opportunity to grow. But Mm -hmm. if I'm going to do an exercise like overhead squats for me, maybe that always, as soon as I finish that movement, you know, I have bad shoulders for a week. I'm going to stay away from that exercise. You know, I'm not going to maybe abandon it completely. Maybe I'll come back to it because maybe there's something for me to learn with that movement. But if it keeps hurting me, I am certainly going to set up boundaries around that particular exercise. And I do the same thing with people. I have people, my family members who, you know, um, I love, like you say, but I will set up clear boundaries where, guess what? We're not going to talk about business. We can talk about other things, but we're not talking about that. Or you don't get to parent me in that way. You know, I, it's like, I just set aside certain people that I, I use for certain things. And I think it's an important component because one of the things that I think people forget about, we oftentimes think about biochemistry, cortisol, and things like that that you're mentioning, is that we don't realize that people are going to impact that as well. In other words, if me and you are hanging out, like we went out and had the best dinner the other night, and I just felt like, you know how you leave a place and you just go, you know, you just feel charged up by someone, right? Yeah. It's a different feeling when you feel drained by someone. Well, that feeling of being charged up and relaxed and kind of being like, oh, I just love that. That is lowering stress hormones. That is setting your biochemistry in a recuperative state and vice versa. When you're with someone that's just like, you know, um, you can't uh, manage the stress or makes you feel less than or you don't feel, you know, relaxed and vital. And so it's just a hugely important component, I think, of this aging and getting better. It is. It's just aging, getting better. And then those people that bring that up, I mean, the other part too, though, in like full disclosure is sometimes people just trigger me. It's nothing to do with them. They're not, there's no fault of theirs. I'm being triggered. And I'm like, yo, dude, these are my monkeys. Like something about this situation or that person is triggering me and I got to go or I got to like back away and it's okay. It's not, it's, it's a hard, but it's, I feel okay to say that now. And, and just, like the other day, I was talking to somebody who I've been on a few dates with. And I was like, I got to admit, like that triggered me hard. And I, it's, I don't know if you're telling the truth or you're lying, or these are just my monkeys and I'm being triggered. Regardless, doesn't matter. I don't like this feeling. 
So I'm not going to lean into this anymore. Like I don't have enough of myself committed to the situation to like remedy it, you know? And like, just knowing that, like knowing that you like, oh, I've only met this person and hung out with them a few times. I don't have to resolve this. I can just say, thank you. Goodbye. And walk away. That's okay too. And it's not, I used to think I had to fix everything, you know, like I had to fix every relationship and I had to fix every, every um, disagreement. Like I would want to fix a disagreement with you because I have a longer time invested in my relationship with you, (laughs) you know, versus, I don't know. And I'm starting to come to that conclusion too. And that's when, I wish I had learned that in my twenties or thirties, but maybe I wouldn't have appreciated it till my forties. I don't know. But one of the things I love about what you just said, and it's the same, same thing for me is that I oftentimes, I think, and this is just a maturity thing, which um, took me a while to get here, but now I do, oh, I do default to looking at myself first when I have a problem with someone. I do go and default and say, okay, let me see if this is about me. And one of the things that, that hints to, gives me a hint that it is, is that if I've seen this pattern show up again and again and again in my, in my life, or I'm triggered by this again and again, then I go, this is on me. And oftentimes when I discern that, I will keep that person in my life simply because I'm like, this is an opportunity for me to fix this pattern. But other times I go, oh, here's this thing. And I don't have this pattern anywhere else. So this person this is the only person that had that I had this thing with. I've never dealt with this before. And oftentimes those types of people, I'll sort of shut down um, pretty quickly. And by shut down, it's just, I think we tend to go, well, you don't want to be mean to people, but you just distance themselves. We have limited sort of, um, and especially you and I, building businesses, looking after our health and fitness. Like we're trying to do all the things, like managing personal relationships. They can be incredibly draining for me. So that's that's how I handle it. So let's do this to kind of you know begin to sort of wrap up. What I like to do is try to give people some you know take homes and to dos where we can kind of say, all right, you know. This is where you get um, Dr. Tina and me to kind of say, look, here, here's our prescription for you, so to speak, you know, in terms of like what, what we think you should begin with, no matter where you are. So let's start with sort of strength and conditioning. And let's assume that this is a person who um, is kind of like, you know what, I'm listening to you, Dr. Tina, I'm listening to Jade, and I want to start getting more into this. Where, you know, where should I begin or what are the top one to three sort of items that, you know, they, they should be aware of? I think they should hire a coach. I think they should look into hiring a coach. That's very helpful. Or find a PT who, or chiropractor who specializes in re, uh, strength training. I, there's more of it, more and more of them happening, and I think that's really cool. I don't know. What do you say? Yeah, I agree with you, and I think it can be done online as well. I mean, but I think ideally, um, hire yourself a real coach in person, like uh, Dr. Tina has. Do that. If not, there's plenty of great coaches online, and there's lots of different group, uh, you know, coaches. Like you know, yeah. there are. CrossFit gets a bad rap, but find a, a good one and you'll right. find some very good coaches that do good work. I agree with that um, for sure. And then it's sort of the next uh, sort of tidbit here is going into the rest and recovery piece. And so what is it that you would recommend? And then I'll kind of go through what I'd recommend for the rest and recovery piece. That's sort of like, this is you know the thing that you must do. You being the, the expert and keeping the joints you know uh, healthy and functioning. Sleeping adequately is key. It's just, it's something I neglect too often. Uh, it's straight up like eight hours of sleep a night is, that's what, I, that's my goal. I don't always hit it, but I think that that's critical. Um, feeding myself well and getting adequate protein, which is particularly rampant in women. We don't eat enough protein. So I think that that's hugely helpful. Um, and having good relationships with people who also honor that something we didn't really talk about, but like making sure that your partner's on board or that the community you spend your time with is also uh, going to be supportive of, of these endeavors and yeah. not sabotage you. Agreed a hundred percent. And actually I'll tell you one of the things I started doing and is I started taking collagen for my joints. It's just yeah. one little tidbit for, you know, cause Dr. Tina is talking about getting adequate protein. And one of the things is, so what I do 10 grams in my coffee, pretty much every morning. My first cup of coffee, I like black coffee with nothing in it. So I'll do black coffee, nothing in it. Then I, yeah. (laughs) Black (laughs) like my soul. (laughs) Yeah. And then I do, then I do a little cream and a little, and a little bit of uh, the, in my second cup, a little cream Uh and a little bit of like about 10 grams of collagen. And I've been doing, it took about three months or so. The research on collagen for joint health is pretty damn cool and skin as well, but it takes a little bit my, my shoulders, which is where I have my problem, have really kind of uh, gotten better there. But I agree. It's like 
it's really taking time. Sleep is tricky for me. Six to seven hours is like, I'm lucky if I get that. I rarely get eight. Um, I also have a little bit of sleep apnea, but you have to prioritize that if you're yeah. going to get, you know, sort of the best. And then I, then I will, I'll, I'll go first on this one and then you can go um, in terms of recovery. What I typically like to do is um, I typically like to either do a three day split. If I'm in a, a period of time where I'm training less, which would be like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday type of workout, mm-hmm. or I do um, typically a four day split where it's like Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and I'm literally now taking either more days off resting or I'm taking about even days off resting, you know? So it's like four to three is the most I'll go in terms of training Mm -hmm. and then resting. And then on those off days, some people be like, well, you're still training Jay, but I'm doing mobility work or I'm doing melt method or I'm doing like light yoga or something like that. How about for you? Well, let me say something about collagen really quick. Just a quick tidbit. Um, I start to notice saggy skin, And my joints start to click and pop a lot more. I get a lot more clicky when my collagen is low. So that's the cue for me and my patients. I'll say that with the so many patients I've treated, particularly women. If you're real poppy clicky, you probably need collagen. So I'll just leave it at that. And then saggy skin. That really helps. What collagen Um, do you like, by the way? Which which one like the uh, any of the ones like vital protein or like just just any? I really like Great Lakes, the green jug that I just get off Amazon. That seems to go into my coffee the easiest and leave no flavor. I've tried all the other ones. Like I've been putzing around with Designs for Health and all these other ones. And it's like, and Vital Proteins. I just, yeah. I don't know. We all find the one we like. I, yeah, it all I, leaves a flavor. Like I like to not have much flavor. So I do like the Great Lakes, but I do like uh, Vital Proteins as well. And then as far as training goes, I have a lot of adrenal issues, like very brittle adrenals. And I can't train more than three days a week. If I, I can, I can move around. I, I usually will go for walks. I really need to incorporate some yoga into my life, but um, yeah, I won't train with weights more than three days a week or I start crying a lot. That's kind of my sign that I'm overtraining. At first I start crying and then everything hurts. And then my, then my libido tanks and my joints hurt. So like, that's not. So, what, so what's, what has been your solution um, in terms of, uh, also supplement wise for adrenals. I know you and I talked about testosterone therapy. I'm on TRT. Well, actually currently I've been off it for a bit. And we talked about the idea that with women, a lot of doctors will do that. I'm not as huge a fan as you are, but one of the things that testosterone does is it, it's a great hormone to use in women, especially when it's low, because it also gives you some estrogen kick. So you're getting yes. two for one when you, you're getting two for one when you do testosterone versus just estrogen. God, but it's, just it's curious. saved my life. Like yeah. it saved my life. I try, I like maca. I think that for middle-aged women, that's been really nice for me. That's helped my libido and just kind of my overall stamina. I like to do stuff that supports my dopamine um, just to keep myself motivated. And I have a variety of adrenal supplements I use. I like to use some medicinal mushrooms, not psych, you know, not psychedelics, but like cordyceps. I'm a big fan of. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really like cordyceps. So I don't know. I kind of just, you know, we're naturopaths. So like we end up with the cupboards full of stuff. Yeah, I, know, I, know. I can't say I'm on any one regimen. There is a product by Quicksilver called Nano Mojo. Mm. Nano, have you seen that? It's a, no, I haven't. you need it, Jade. Okay. It's amazing. It's called Nano Mojo. I have no affiliate with them or anything, but I love I'm this stuff. I'm taking your notes when Dr. Tina gives you a, 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 a tip like that. I'm writing it Nano down. Nano Mojo. I, I have sent a bottle to like everyone that I know and they love it. I've got everyone on Nano, Nano Mojo, and it travels well. It's sublingual. It tastes good. It's some like ancient Chinese Korean herbal yeah. formula. It's great. Yeah, I I do a lot of um I do a lot of ashwagandha, and I go back and forth between ashwagandha and rhodiola. They're my they're oh, my yeah. favorites, and I know that anyone who kind of d- dabbles in adaptogen use is always on those two. But I do a lot of those. Red, All right, rad. And anything else with sort of that that management before I, before I, we get into the tidbits with just managing people and that kind of stuff, and, and then we'll kind of wrap up. Um, learn to cook. I I can't even believe it. Like I can't believe how many of my health issues that I've been supplementing around for the past two decades have gone away with just cooking at home. I, I can't even believe it. Like I feel like such a dumbass, Jade. That I <laughs> <laughs> I'm so I'm so mad at myself that I didn't just embrace this, like the freaking instant pot. I am the instant pot queen. And it is so easy to just have good cook, at least for one meal a day, like a good consistent meal that I made at home that I know what the ingredients are. I know what the fat, you know, it's a good, healthy fat. It's whatever I'm getting my stuff. And, uh, that's been life changing for me. So, so, so you're going to, this is, this is embarrassing for me to say, but I don't cook at all. I (laughs) eat most of my food and 
I make big salads sometimes, and I do make my dad's pasta sauce. <laughs> that, that's about that's about that's about it. But so, just briefly, how did you learn? Did you go to a, a cooking school? Did you do, learn it online, or you just got a cookbook and just started trial and error and playing? I just have an instant pot, and I started posting about it on Instagram, and people started sending me recipes, and I just got creative. I realized curry. I really love curry for a variety of health reasons, but it like does wonderful things for my gut. So I just make a ton of curry. So I always have like a curry, some carbohydrates in the fridge, you know, and um, I keep it all separate so I can mix it up based on how I trained. Like yesterday I carved out, which is awesome. Yeah. The instant pot. I'm telling you, I could do a whole, I could have a whole online platform just being the instant pot queen. (laughs) Because if anyone can, if I can do it, trust me, like I didn't even know how to hard boil eggs a few months ago. (laughs) Okay. So maybe I'm not so bad off then. (laughs) No, if you just made one instant pot meal a week, Jade, I'll, I'll teach you. If you do that, you'll have at least for me, it's like at least 50% of my food is at home. Right. So, and I, and I always talk about soup, salad, scramble, shakes, stews. I mean, basically you get the Instant Pot Instant can do, pot. <laughs> de- definitely do the stews and the stir fries and all that kind of stuff. And then I bought an air fryer that is a lid that sits on top of my Instant Pot. So I can air fry, like I air fried sweet potato fries yesterday. I air fried Brussels sprouts. I air fried chicken breast. Amazing. And then I slice it and I stick it in the freezer. Like I don't know how to meal prep. I don't know how to do any of this stuff, you guys. So like. I'm learning and I'm really proud of myself because it's made just astronomical uh, shifts in my health. So. Yeah. And it's funny you eat now. I mean, like talk about inflammatory responses in the body that, that are not controlled and continuous. Um, try eating the standard American diet. So trust me, I, I know a lot of people might be listening to this. I get mostly very savvy professionals listening to my, my podcast, but there are always newbies and, People always are asking, does food make that big of a difference? It is huge, huge the difference it can make. Uh, Exactly. So it's like, I do think it's probably one of the most important things. You hear about it all the time, but it's it's huge. All right. So to kind of uh, what I want to do is just wrap up with sort of the resilience part of like the relationship piece. And like, you know, let's go through that really quickly. Like if you were going to say, this is so individual and I always love this. It's kind of talking to people. How what would be the, the one to two to three things that you would say, look, when you're dealing with people, like how have you managed that? And, you know, what, what, where would you start people? With just dealing with people in general? Yeah, like how you've, you've obviously structured your life in a way where you have, you know, you have eliminated, you talked about the idea of eliminating all these toxic, you know, individuals and you have a very close knit circle. And, you know, obviously you're always going to deal with some people that you love that are, that are troublesome, but you this idea, same with me at 45, where I'm like, a lot of the, the relationships that would cause me strife and stress and all that have been put in their appropriate places. And some yeah. of them have been eliminated completely. And so I'm just curious, like, if you have any tidbits around that, and I, I do as well, and then we'll kind of go from there. Oh, I'm super careful who I let around me, uh, as far as people I coach people I let into, this is why none of, you'll never see any of my injection therapy courses being done through a school because I want to have full autonomy over who I keep around and who I don't. Cause sometimes I just don't get along with people or they, you know, we rub each other the wrong way or there's just too much friction. It's not worth it to me. So I'm very careful about who I choose in that capacity, who I'll work with. I'm careful about who I'll, um, even in this situation, like I'm careful about who I'll podcast with and have conversations with, cause all of this impacts our neuro hormones and, and our, you know, our biochemistry Um, and like like you said, I think it's huge just coming back to yourself and what, like one of the things I'll do when I start to feel that grading feeling is like, or that reactive feeling is I stop and pause, which I mean, God, that took decades to learn (laughs) to just pause and think, why am I being triggered? Like I am being triggered. Acknowledge that. Okay. Step one, why, what's going on? Is it, is it my relationship? But like, I realized recently my dad triggers the shit shit out of me and I am trying to unwind why like I know right talking about like the ultimate but man I get triggered fast with him I and what I have a temper so if my temper starts to go I'm like either I'm not well rested I'm underfed I'm tired I'm whatever I'm overstressed or and or I'm being triggered by something what's coming up for me and so that's helped a ton yeah and then sometimes just making a quick cut like you know what awesome great to know you I don't think our relationship needs to go any further. Love and light. Like I bless them with all the good energy, but like don't want them around. And I'm okay with that. 
Yeah, like almost similar, like this romantic relationship that you had started and you're just kind of like, I don't think this is going to work. Same, same same with me. And you know, it's interesting too. And this actually goes back to yours and my relationships. Like you do also get triggered by people in positive ways. Like I, mm-hmm. Tina's always been, we, her and I talked about it. She's always been someone that I felt drawn to. And, you know, since I've, since I've seen her, interacted with her, and you have to act on that sometimes as well. It's part of like saying, who are the kind of people that I would like to have in my life? And putting yourself out there. It's like, you know, one of the things I was talking to a friend of mine is like, you know, looking that she was looking for a particular romantic, you know, partner. And she's like, how do you even go about that? I said, well, what do you love? And she's like, well, I want someone who's making their own money. You know, they don't have to be rich, but they have to make their own money and do fairly well. I want someone who's fit and lives that lifestyle. I want someone who's relatively outgoing. And I'm like, well, there you go. You need to join a CrossFit gym because people who do that tend to be more outgoing. They like working out in groups. They tend to have plenty of money you know, because it costs a bit to be at a a CrossFit gym and they're going to be into fitness. And so you have to go and sort of, you know, create this. And then you have to also go with people who are the opposite of that. Doesn't mean you don't love them. Some of them are your family members, but you just, you interact with them in particular ways. And I love the idea of like always looking at your patterns because in the end, that's what, that's what does it. Um, yes, and if, if you want to invite people in who are of a high caliber, you must also be of a high caliber yourself, right? So like doing the work to be interesting, doing the work to be fulfilled, doing the work to be happy, making your own money, making your own way. Like I can't expect some guy to show up who has all those qualities if I'm not already doing it myself. Um, and then yeah. and then just finding that community, like you said, I think that's so key. Just I'm, I'm a, such an introvert sometimes and such a hermit, especially in Oregon. I can be so such a hermit. So I'm really trying this year to like branch out. Like I want to take a pottery class and like, I'm just putting myself out there in ways that I wouldn't normally because I need more community. Cause I, as much as I think I'm fine by myself, my aura ring, interestingly, Jade, my aura ring tells me on the, on the uh, weekends when I have workshops, when I'm teaching or when I'm around people, yeah. my heart rate variability goes up significantly. Oh, I love that. So interesting. Yeah, it blows me away. Like it was really, really, really low this summer after a breakup and a move and a lot of stress and my dog died. And then I went and I went to the A and P. And even though I didn't speak the first day, my heart rate variability skyrocketed. The day I spoke, when I'm really speaking my truth, the days when I'm actually like doing what I love, like when I'm teaching prolo, my heart rate variability goes up 20, 30 points sometimes. It's crazy. I so. love that. For those of you who don't know the R ring, it's something that um, Dr. Tina and I both have, and it measures heart rate variability, which is a measure of stress um, and your ability to recover, sympathetic, parasympathetic sort of balance. And what she's essentially describing here is that social interaction, but specifically her teaching and doing her purpose plus social interaction is causing her stress, uh, her ability to recover, to like rebound significantly. I just love that. And I'm going to start watching that um, because, you know, we do similar things and you and I are very similar. I'm introverted as well. Left to my own devices. I I can end up being like a hermit. My dad dad always says to me, he's like, you know, you're going to be one of those guys that is dead in this apartment for like a month before anyone knows. (laughs) And I'm like, you know, what? you're probably right about that. Tina, I just adore you so much. Tell us, <laughs> for people who want to, you know, I know you're very hard to, to get now because you're doing lots of education, which we're so lucky to have you in that place. But for people who want to find you, get more exposed to your work, where what's the best place for them to get you? Um, head, you know, head over to my, if, you, if, if they would be interested, head over to my website at drtina.com, D-R-T-Y-N-A.com. You can grab my free book there. I have a great book. It's like six easy, seven easy chapters all about this stuff. And then when you click through, once you get it, it'll drop you onto my website and you can find a cheat sheet there where you can, if you're interested in getting prolotherapy, there's a cheat sheet there that answers kind of all the common questions that I've encountered over the years. And then a link to find a practitioner in your area, because I know a lot of, a lot of times these podcasts, when I mention that stuff, people uh, are interested or, and follow me on Instagram. It's all there too. In my bio, drtina.com, D-R-T-Y-N-A. And uh, I have a podcast, painfreestrongradio.com. You can find all that on my Instagram. And Jade, did an, we did an awesome episode a few months ago that you guys can listen to on there that we talked about some of the same stuff, but more metabolic and, and all that jazz, which is his specialty. Yeah, just so you, everyone listening knows, like, uh, Tina's one of my favorite people to follow now. <laughs> it's like you, you need to have people in your, in your life who are, you have, you have easily become the person I look for to keep, you know, myself sort of pain free like I'm sort of looking at you for that education and it's, it's nice right because we get to build all these different silos of like this is my go-to person um, for this 
and, awesome. and plus I just, I just love your vibe. And that's what Instagram too is kind of cool for that. Right. Cause you get to, you get to curate, you know, sort of this social media sort of bubble, but I love you, my friend. Thanks for being oh, on and hanging. I will Thank see you. you. Bye. Awesome. <laughs>